we have three entities to Harm Reduction Institute. We have Sex Harm Reduction Institute, the AIDS Brigade, which does the work of harm reduction and syringe exchange and overdose prevention. We have Sex Workers Advocacy Network, which is a project directed by my wife, Teresa McCorkle, that works with sex workers, people in the sex industry, film industry, brothels throughout the state of Indiana. And we have Empower, which is our publishing arm in which we publish educational materials. Just in the last two years, we started doing overdose prevention, but I'll share that a little bit later. I have to read some of the things. We had um, one time, we, serve, we do syringe exchange. We actually don't do actual syringe exchange. We do syringe ex distribution. We do wholesale distribution. So if you come to us and you need 100 syringes, that's what we give you. We find out how you use your drugs, whatever that drug of choice is. If it's heroin, we use three or four times a day. What we do is we multiply that by seven and give you what you need for the week. That's if you come to us the first time. The second time that you come to us, we ask you how many do you do drugs with your friends or your partners or significant others. And if you say yes, then we will give you enough to take care of their, your partner's needs or your community's needs. If that means that you need a thousand syringes from us and sharps containers, all the supplies necessary to do harm reduction, that's what we give you. The only thing we ask in return is that you bring us back the data either by email, call us up, and we've never had anybody not give us the data once we explain how important it is for us to do research. Um, as you see, we're very research-based. Um, um, our participants, we had 54 drug reversals, 14 drug reversals in 2010. We have, now we're up to 30 drug reversals. We give nanoxinol to people. Under the federal law, we're allowed to distribute nanoxinol because it's not a federally regulated drug. Um, we have to get it from the pharmacy through a doctor, but then we're allowed to distribute it. If I'm arrested doing it, the only thing they can get me on is distributing with um, medicine without a license. And um, the lawyers have assured me if I go to court on that charge, I'm only saving people's lives by giving them the Noxin. I train people how to use it. And as I said, we have 30 drug reversals so far this year, last year and this year included. And we're real proud of that. And we just had one the other day before I came here. And we can we document all that through the emergency room. Um, Forty-three percent male, forty-seven percent female. Transgendered is ten percent. Our transgender population, we distribute a lot of syringes to them because they do silicone injections for their face and for their body, and a lot of them are um, using meth. Um, 23% African Americans, 55% Caucasians, 15% Hispanics, 3% African American. Other Africans, we serve a lot of people from um, South Africa and from other African nations. Um, one of the things that's caused a problem for me in the community is um, some groups have said, I don't serve enough African Americans. So my answer to the minority based community groups is, I will give you all the syringes you need, all the supplies you need, er everything you need to do harm reduction. You serve your own community if you think I'm not doing good enough. Nobody's ever taken me up on that offer. They come up with all kinds of excuses. They have to get permission from the police, from the ministers, from other community leaders. Um, I've never sought permission from anybody to do this work. I only sought permission from the people that I serve, to, um, my family. I call them my family because we we use participants just because we have to get grants and funding. But for me, they're my family members and they they're come to my home. We have some basic rules when they come to my home. We ask them, don't bring any weapons and don't bring any drugs into my home. Leave them out in your car. And if you disrespect me, then you're not welcome to my home. I'll come to you and the community. But if I invite you into my home, I don't want you to bring any weapons in my home or open drugs. Or You're not allowed to do drugs in my home. And if they can't respect me, then I go to people in the community and I serve their needs wherever they want me to go to. But it's just give and take. It's a mutual respect. I give people respect and I expect respect back. We don't ask anybody to bring any syringes to us. I find it interesting that the only population that's been forced to bring a deadly instrument across town is drug users. We don't force white gay men or black gay men to carry a dirty condom across town to get a condom. But somehow we tell drug users the responsible thing for that drug user is to carry a syringe across the neighborhood. That's not good public health policy. 
And then the public health department says, well, they don't dispose of them properly. I provide sharps containers. But where do you think diabetics throw their syringes? They throw them in a garbage can. Public health policy leaders aren't worried about diabetics. If they're so concerned about it, I can get the uh, fit packs for $1.50 of each. And then get them for a dollar and a quarter. The cheapest I ever been able to get a fit pack that she showed earlier in her presentation is it's a dollar twenty-five. Again, through data purchase through the network, the North American Syringe Exchange Network, which is a network of all the syringe exchange projects in North America. We sort of work together. Like um, in Oklahoma, all their syringes blew away last year in a tornado, so we sent them ten thousand in return. They sent us back fifteen thousand condoms from the public health department. Oops, the public health department just found that out. <laughs> um, our, our participants use 37% heroin, 5% um, other drugs with heroin, heroin and cocaine, 33%, meth, 30%, crack, 5%. And you can inject crack. The danger of injecting crack is that um, if you don't cut it and you don't cut it down properly, it can harden in your vein, you go straight to your heart, and you can die. So we educate people how to do it properly using... Um, lemon oil and, and lemon juice. Insulin, 5%. We, get, we, serve a, we have a lot of illegal aliens in our community and undocumented people, and they can't afford to go to a doctor for some obvious reason. So we provide a lot of diabetic syringes to them. Silicone, a lot of people inject silicone hormones. A lot of people do hormone injections. So we take care of everybody's needs, and at least we try to do the best we can. Um, we exchanged and distributed 72,000 syringes last year. We could do a million syringes in our state. We just don't have the funding base to do that. Even though they're seven and a half cents, eight cents a piece, we just don't have the funding to do that. We do all our work is done through a network. We have the largest network of peer-to-peer -peer exchangers in the Midwest. We educate people how to. People have been doing syringe exchange for years. They don't need a lot of education. All we ask people is do, don't sell the syringes that we provide to you and don't rent them. If we find out people rent syringes or, or sell them to other people, we will cut that one person off, but we won't cut the rest of his community off that is getting syringes. We make it clear you can come to us. So if anybody has a bitch and a complaint about, they go to the person that they were getting syringes from originally, and that stops it. Plus, we're a capitalist country, and people aren't going to buy what they can get for free. And people always say the drug users are in the middle of drug fee and they're going to not use clean. I never heard of anybody not using a clean syringe if they had an opportunity to use a clean syringe. People will use it. I've been doing this for almost two decades, and we've only had four to five incidents of people selling syringes. And as I said, we stopped, and it, it worked out, and people understood. We supply syringes to a lot of dope houses. We have one dope there that's giving clean syringes, and everybody that buys heroin bag from him, he's giving clean syringes to and it works well. We, we give them sharps containers. We just ask them, don't rent them. If we find out, we cut them off. But we won't cut off the people that are use the house. We just cut off him. Same thing with our condoms that we get, provide condoms to. If you sell the condoms, then we're just going to cut you off and keep your individuals, give them what they need. Uh, we give wound care kits to people, and we educate people how to take care of their wounds. If they have more serious ones, we refer them to um, the public health department. I'm fortunate I work for the Marion County Health Department, but I can't speak on their behalf today. I don't represent them here today. But I've been with them for almost 18 years, and I've been doing this work for almost two decades. They know what I do, and I'm just a troubled employee who's out here doing this. I joke, but they always say I'm a trouble. When they have management meetings, my name comes up in management all the time. And what did Larry say today? What did Larry say on CNN? And why did Larry approach President Obama and hand him a sharps container and said, get on with and do what you have to do, lift the ban and put money? Why does he do these things? But I just do them anyway. What can they do to me? Um, we give fit packs, as I said. 3,400 pick packs we exchanged and we just gave out. Um, we give them out on a regular basis. We, my apartment's kind of weird. I have a one-bedroom apartment, but every closet in my house um, has syringes and condoms, so I have to move some out to make room for my wife's clothes, or I would not be able to sleep in my bedroom. So I let her have the walk-in closet, and I took 
part of the living room and we turn it into a storage area so we have boxes and boxes of supplies and stuff and it's it's a strange situation um, we just we get, also give out crack kits they rubber tips I try to bring my kits with me but I've walked out of the house without them they're just rubber um, carburetor tips we give them out to people to put over their pipes so they don't burn their lips um, and we are getting some cases of um, actual crack pipes from Canada Canada gives them they're more progressive than we are they actually give out the pipes but um, I don't want to be that progressive. It's hard to go into jail. Um, we give out safe injection kits. They have our, all the supplies in them. So they can use one use kits. We refer a lot of people to testing sites throughout the community, throughout the state. Um, the Medicare providers, we refer anybody that wants treatment or any kind of medical services, we refer a lot of people to services. Um, we support all kinds of treatment, whatever people want. 12-step, religious-based treatment, therapeutic communities. Anytime people want treatment, we'll do the best that we can. If they don't want any treatment, that's on. We just say thank you. We just continue to use safely. Um, uh, we also, um, I'm going to talk about this, Sex Workers Advocacy Network. Um, we serve 325 active sex workers. We provide materials to the S&M community. To, to underground swing clubs in our community, to other swing clubs, and 60 other adult sex industries. My wife um, works, my wife is an active sex worker. And I share that because it's important to the work that I do. I had to get over that stigma. Of my, my, I knew what my wife was when I married her. She was a sex worker. So I had to be, as a man, I had a male, I had to get over that stigma. So for me, it's about business for her. It's not about love or relationships. For me, her, it's about business. And she works in an adult bookstore and she also does sex. So I had, I had to go home and deal with that mentally in my own head. So that's fine. I've, I've overcome that. It's about a business to me. I know who she comes home to every night. And when I share that at conferences and talk about it, they say, how can you stand that of your wife? For me, you know, it's, I love my wife. It's about business. It's like any other business that she just happens to provide a service. And she also is the co-director of Harm Reduction Institute, and I've been with her for nine years. I've been living with AIDS for over um, 23 years. I've been in recovery. I, I use other substances for my health. I use uh, cannabis for my health. And I use other drugs when I want to use other drugs. I just don't inject heroin today. And I'm very proud of that. I, I made a decision years ago in my life that I didn't feel like doing that anymore in my life but I'm no better than the people that I serve so I just like I said I use participants because I'm forced by grants to use that but for me they're my family they're really only family I've known I grew up in a I tell you a little bit about myself I grew up in an organized crime family in New York City um, around mobsters all my life around gangsters I sold dope most of my adult life I made millions of dollars lots of money myself and my family um, I lost everything when I became when I became positive and stopped using drugs. I lost everything, but today I, I'm a very grateful person. I rather live on I, I I live in a one bedroom apartment, and I'm happy. I'm living with AIDS, but I'm a happy person. I wouldn't go back to all that money and my family if you paid me anything in my life. I just live my life one day at a time, the best that I can, and paying it forward to my community has been doing what I'm doing today. I get criticized a lot. My, my biggest opponents aren't the police, aren't the general public. It's the AIDS community themselves because I'm an embarrassment to them. I simply say to why do I have to do this work? You get funding to do this work. You get multi-millions of dollars to provide service to the community. You should be doing this. But they've decided in their wisdom, and the CDC's wisdom today is to serve the needs of Men having sex with men. That's what most of their money is going to go to next year in your communities. So when you see your, fund, your groups short funded and not getting funded next year, you simply can say that's the president's national AIDS policy strategy working. That's what we've been given. I heard so much today, I, I interject my, what I say with politics because it's important. When you look at the national strategy on AIDS, there's no funding attached to it. 
There's no money attached to it. It's just a strategy. But we need more from the president. We need more from the Congress. We need leadership. And that's where you all come in when you go back to your community, demand funding. Say to your AIDS agencies, if you have drug users in your community, demand action, demand service. Or find some activists that are willing to do it in your community. We're, we're always around. I'm willing to come to any state to talk. If you just help me out, I'll come and share whatever I have with you. And if you need supplies, you can email me. you got my information. I'll send you whatever supplies you need. I don't have any money, but I can send you supplies. If you need a 1,000 syringes, I ship them. Um, you're allowed to ship syringes UPS or FedEx. If you're a wise, a word to the wise, don't ever ship syringes by United States mail. They will arrest you for violation of Federal Paraphernalia Act. But UPS, if you mark on the box medical supplies, it's okay. I've just an experience I've learned over doing this work. That's how you ship things. Um, This is for our, um, the project with Sex Workers Advocacy Network. Um, same thing. We also have Empower, which is our educational arm. We, put, we provide materials to this, some groups in our city that we provide in our state that we provide them materials and educational documents to. Um, right now, we're, we're about to start a national campaign through, with Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, it probably be starting next week or a couple weeks later. They're going to get the information out. We want people from throughout the country to call our State Department of Health um, to demand that drug users be included in our priority population or our prevention plan. Right now, injection drug users were taken out of our prevention plan and put as a watched population. Even though the third largest transmission rate in our state overall for both African American men and women, for men having sex with men, for heterosexuals, is through injection drug use. But our state, because of the funding situation, our state spends no money on HIV and AIDS, legislatively. Our money comes from the federal government. So through CDC and HRSA and SAMHSA, we're at their beck and call. What they say to do with their money, we have to do with their money, or they will take back their money. Um, there are other people doing harm reduction in our state. There's a minister doing it who's living with AIDS also. He does it in the northern part of the state. In 2011, we we're we're started interviewing sex workers and finding out what they need, what their exact needs are in the community, what kind of services they need, and we will change accordingly our policies and what we do. Um, I'm going over this quickly so I can share with you some other things. These are our funders. Um, I told the Pasco Family Fund is money from my family. I've spent over $150,000 of my own money doing this work um, to right now where I have no money to spend. Um, citywide harm reduction in, in, the, um, in the Bronx, New York, drove a van from the Bronx to Indianapolis and gave it to us, a used van, because they were getting a new one. Um, Broadway Cares just gave us $5,000. Indiana AIDS Fund has given us technical assistance, but we've been blocked. There are Indiana AIDS Fund is the largest AIDS charity in our state. We're not allowed to get funding from them because the State Department of Health says that syringe exchange is illegal. But the Attorney General of our, our state says, I'm doing under research and he won't risk a political trial because he knows if they arrest me, I would want to go on trial and then I would call every single AIDS member in the, of the policy group's leaders in our state. Do they support syringe? They all support syringe exchange on paper. When there's money attached to this injection drug users, then state after state will fall and they will do syringe exchange because it's going to be all about money for them. Just as men having sex with men, nobody cared about that population until now there's money attached to it. So, if, And that's what I'm doing. But what I wanted to share with you is, um, i take some questions out there, is, is that syringe exchange isn't very difficult, it is very complicated. You just got to meet people where they're at and what their needs are in the community. As I said, we do we do one-to-one -one syringes. If they want to bring us syringes, that's fine in a sharps container or a bleach bottle, whatever they want to bring it to. If they don't have any to bring, we don't ask anything of anybody because it's about service to them. We provide them fit packs. We provide them larger sharps containers. If they're serving 40 or 30 people in their little network, we provide a two-gallon or a three-gallon sharps containers. 
Um, them I borrow or acquire. <laughs> I acquire lots of stuff. I have a lot of doctors who let me in their medical supply rooms. I go to Chicago, Chicago Recovery Alliance, which is the largest needle exchange in the Midwest. They exchange three million syringes a year. So I go to their project, I load up my van. Other projects help, I help them. Like I said, I sent 10,000 syringes to, um, um, to Oklahoma. They sent 15,000 condoms back. We thanked them and we also get some money from the porn industry. Ron Jeremy helps us with a couple thousand every year. Jenna Jameson has helped us um, with at least 2,000, 2,500 every year. Um, Larry Flint, we have a grant into him. He wants to give, um, for all your information, he, he's going to be rolling out an RFP next year, sometime in 2012. He's going to be giving away up to $5 million to AIDS funds. And the reason he's doing that is his wife died of AIDS years and years ago. So he's going to be giving a lot of money away. And we've, had some, we've been attacked by some women's groups at the university. Why do I take porn money? I said to the women's groups, if um, replace what I take, and I won't take their money. But porn money is dollars and it buys supplies. And they're just everyday people making money. You know? So um, for me, it's, 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 it's the, I, have to, I run a $100,000 organization on less than a $10,000 budget. And it's not about buying syringes. Like I said, if I could buy a million syringes, I would buy a million syringes. I just don't have the funds. But I, you know, we serve what we can. This year, last year, 72,000. Probably the end of this year, probably be 100,000 syringes throughout the whole state. And half of them we ship. We ship, we can't drive the Muncie, so we ship them a thousand syringes. We go to the campus, ship them a thousand, ship to these people two thousand. And in Indianapolis, which is our biggest county, Marion County, we probably give out the bulk of our supplies. We also give out close to a hundred thousand condoms or more. I work for the public so I, I'm able to do that. I'm able to supplement a lot of supplies to my legitimate job. Not that this isn't legitimate, but through my job I get paid to do. I'm allowed to talk about harm reduction because we're a legal organization. We're a registered 501c3, IRS recognizes. Even for our sex work, we are recognized by the IRS. It took us a couple years to get our organization recognized because the IRS doesn't usually like to recognize sex work. But we tell all the sex workers that we work with, they're all independent contractors. They pay their taxes. They register as independent contractors, so they pay their taxes. And that's what they tell the IRS. We dance or we're an independent contractor. And the IRS accepts it, so they have approved us and we're approved. Um, I recently got kicked off the community planning group for being too vocal at a meeting. I called a health commissioner of our state a racist. I said if the majority of, of people becoming infected in our state were white, he would care. But because they're people of color, he doesn't care. He said, you can't call me. I said, I did call you a racist, so what are you going to do? Um, we have an epidemic of hepatitis C in our state. All young people, all young whites, between the ages of 18 to 30. These young people have, don't have histories of drinking. There is no other correlation, but they injected drugs. They started at 15 or 16, 17. So because of that history, now they have hepatitis C. All this could be prevented. I'm an activist for, with ACT UP years ago. I was one of the leaders of ACT UP. All this could have been prevented, this tragedy. We're 30 years into AIDS. All this could have been prevented if our government had only listened to the activists around the streets. We wouldn't have this Holocaust today if our government had truly cared and listened. But they didn't. So now we're at where we're at. And what's happening is the disenfranchised are getting more disenfranchised and more disempowered. And what we have is a national strategy on paper, but with no money. We have the CDCs changing their whole policy direction where they're going to fund to get massive amounts of money to men having sex with men. It's true, men having sex with men is the largest mode of transmission. But you simply can't leave whole populations of people out. You can't say to the District of Columbia, which has one of the highest rates of HIV in the country, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get a lot of funding now. You can't say to a community that has a, a like District of Columbia or any other large communities that have an influx of injection drug users, I'm sorry, but your, your time will come. 
I always say in my state, well, our time has come now. We're going to take what we want. So um, in Chicago, they cut, for example, they cut the budget by um, last year. They tried to cut the budget for treatment for addicts um, by half. So what Chicago Recovery Alliance did is brought 500 active drug users, told them, bring their little suitcases. They knew the commissioner of health would be there. All the pol Mayor Daly was there. They all wanted treatment on the spot. So what the mayor had to do is call social workers from all over the state to interview every single 500 persons that were there. They found treatment for 250 people. So we asked them, if you found people, instant treatment for these people, you can't find treatment for the other 250? They didn't qualify. They weren't addicted enough. Um, we, like I said, we trained people how to use an anoxinal overdose prevention medication. It's technically legal because we're not violent. And we need a script to get it from the pharmacy. We don't need a script to provide it to people in our community. The worst thing get me on is prescribing without a license. Um, and then if they bring me up on charges, I'm only providing a medication that's available by script anyway. Um, we refer people to buprenorphine treatment in Chicago. We don't have that in our state yet because our state's not progressive enough. They keep, for 20 years, they keep saying needle exchange is down the road. We're studying it. We used, they just spent $100,000 studying needle exchange in our state. A health foundation studied the issue. Never once did they talk to me or to other people doing harm reduction. They never spoke to us. They didn't want our data. They said it was insignificant. My data comes from Beth Israel Hospital, one of the best research facilities in the country. That's who I submit my data to to stay legal. Professor Don DeGioia, you can't get any better than Don DeGioia. He's a world-renowned researcher. You can't get any better than him. Dr. Sarah Maxwell in Chicago, um, who's an amazing, heroic woman. If, if you ever go to Chicago to meet her, she's, a, she's one of the world-renowned specialists on addictions. So basically what we've done, we've tried to work within the system, but we work outside of the system also. I'm like a, part of my, I'm a bastard stepchild of the AIDS community. They don't like what we do, but they always want my data. So now I'm saying to you, fine, there's a price attached to this. You could supply me with technical assistance in writing grants. I'm not a perfect grant writer, but I go to university and let to help them help me. I have some graduate students who will help me write grants because I'm not a, I, I know how to, I don't know how to put the words. You know, I have a, a degree in public health, but I don't know how to write grants yet. But, um, like I said, I don't use any AIDS medications today. I just recently sell, um, had a heart attack this year about three months ago. I have stents in me. Um, I had a stroke this year, so I had to learn how to walk on my right side, walk uh, partly again. But I do what I do because it's moral. Um, like I said, we have people come to our house. We meet people wherever they're at. Um, my wife takes care of people's kids. Um, if they need to go to treatment, we help them out the best that we can. We just have some basic fundamental rules. Uh, you know, um, the other guy spoke about outreach. Um, we don't give a lot of money to people. We give help to people. If people need food, we'll help them with food. We don't give cash because we don't have any cash ourselves. Me and my wife live from paycheck to paycheck. We supplement this work the best we can. So I hope I shared some stuff about harm reduction with you and about the importance of this work. It's, for me, it's about paying forward to my community. It's about giving back. Uh, for other people, other people have other reasons for doing harm reduction and syringe exchange. And I understand people have to work within the system. I know Rhode Island, I know other states have to work through um, their legal system, through gatekeepers, and et cetera, et cetera. I chose not to go that path. I didn't ask permission of anybody. They didn't ask permission from me to, to use my name or to, to research or talk, you know. Um, I just do what I do because it's about doing. So I'm just going to take any questions. I know it's a small crowd. You want to go have some dinner. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I get nervous at things like this. So. Is there any questions? Uh, I wanted to talk about when you said you were kicked off the community planning group. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but uh, in Delaware, we are, we are experiencing similar Arguments, similar challenges um, as a result of the 
Montreal Cities Project, and we are not one of them, uh, we have experienced severe cuts in our state on our HIV prevention programming. And um, as a result, the, there are a few people, we actually think it's one, that makes the decision all by himself about how money should be allocated. And um, we did use words like, this is institutional racism, you know. Um, nobody's been kicked off the planning group yet, but because the health department does actually fund the student planning group, it really does tie our, it, it really creates sort of shackles on us as activists for our own programs and disenfranchised people. Um, and, you know, it, now I was just wondering from you, you know, you seem like such a successful advocate that works outside of the system. In this milieu, in this environment where you are actually kicked out of the community plan group, which would be devastating. I mean, that seems like they're really losing a really strong voice. What are your other routes? Well, actually, what the, if, you, if you really know the history of the community planning groups, why the community planning groups were first started. They were start, they didn't, CDC didn't do this out of kindness, start this community planning group process. It was because of ACT UP and other activists demanded the inclusion. The CDC right now does not, doesn't want the community planning groups in place. They're doing everything they can to either unfund them or not fund them, have them go to state funding. A lot of CPGs are going to that the health departments run them and direct them. Well, it takes money to, supposedly it takes money to run a meeting. That's, I understand the pro CPG process. They have to have, you have to pay other members to come from all throughout the state. Other states' CPGs are bigger. Our state, they come from all over the state. I understand that. And I understand that I, um, I've been a member of the CPG for 10 years. I understand they wanted fresh blood. I'm willing to accept it. So what I do is I simply go to meetings as a member of the public and I ask for documents. I asked our State Department of Health for legal documents under the open meeting laws and because it's a federal meeting. It's technically a CPGs, but people don't know. It's community planning groups. If you receive funding from your federal government, from CDC, to run a community planning group, they also have to obey not only the state laws, open meeting laws of that state, they also have to obey the federal laws governed by the Centers for Disease Control. They have a Internal General, Inspector General, who handles complaints against that. They have to follow their law also and their policy. They have to supply you with every single document. So what I do is I request every single amount of paperwork from the State Department of Health concerning HIV and AIDS. They, they say there's other, for example, when I say there's the third largest mode of transmission is injection drug users, they say that's factually true. The numbers are correct. But there's other factors. When you ask them what other other factors, it's economic, it's people not going to treatment when offered, and a whole bunch of excuses, but it doesn't erase the fact. That the, so I have other avenues I pursue, but the fact of the matter is I'm, I'm, I'm sort of glad that I got asked to, re, to leave because it enables me to do other things and other activist type work. Um, I work out of the system, but I also have, I know how to use the system. I use their data. All the data, that, the data up here was my data, but I use their numbers. They produce the data that goes to the Centers for Disease Control. I use all their numbers against them. We have communities in our state, as in, I don't know if it's the states, what they do here, or in Maryland, or any other state. We have communities bidding to get prison systems built. Most of our prisons, 70% of our prison systems in the state of Indiana are privately owned, including the halfway houses are all privately owned. They trade on, on Wall Street, it's big money. So communities will fight to get prison systems built in the community. We have one community, a treatment center, offer to come in, take over in an abandoned hospital, build a 250 bed treatment facility for women and children, have everything on board. Community said no. They tore down that property and built a private halfway house because that's what the community wants. It's about money. So people have to understand HIV and AIDS 
we have a prison system that in our state, every prisoner who enters the system is tested for HIV. So we have a system right now that says there's roughly 2,500 inmates tested positive going into the system. But yet, when you look at all these people returning to the community, there's hundreds and hundreds of more coming out of the prison system infected. The state says, well, that's the window period and you don't understand the process. Yeah, I don't understand the process. They had sex and they used drugs in prison, in a private prison system. Everybody knows that goes on in prison. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. But the communities, that's what they want. When it comes to HIV and AIDS, we, I was at a governor's conference. I, I walked in on a governor's conference when I had a public comment and I asked my questions. I asked Mitch Daniels, what is he doing about HIV and AIDS? He said, that's not my, that's not my purview. I'm not, not my area. Then when he said, well, some, he said, well, syringe exchange doesn't exist. I raised my hand and said, yes, it does. His attorney general said, looked at him and said, I wish you'd just not say anything about it. The man's here doing it. He's been doing it for two decades. If we arrest him, he's going to demand a trial. Like, um, I'm not afraid. I've been tried twice. I've been acquitted twice. In Boston, I was acquitted uh, along with John Parker. For those of you who don't know, John Parker is one of the first activists that did needle exchange in North America. Right now, he's in Vietnam doing syringe exchange. I've been invited to go to Cuba next year to, um, to help set up some needle exchanges if I can get the funding to go. They're going to allow me as a person with AIDS to come to Cuba. Cuba has, used to have very restrictive policies concerning people with AIDS. They used to imprison them and put them in quarantine. When Fidel Castro came to New York years ago, he met with activists from Streetworks and other projects, and he went back and changed his whole policy because he realized what he was doing was morally wrong. They still have repressive, some repressive activities, but they, at least they, they go on as far as they want activists to come in from open society and other groups to come in. Um, so for me, I, I mix what I do, I, mix, I talk about politics, because it is about politics. If drug users, uh, I belong to the global network of people with AIDS. Uh, when the International AIDS Conference comes back to this country, I guarantee it's not going to be a pleasant little conference for people. There's going to be activism there. There's going to be ACT UP there, National AIDS Brigade, other groups there, because it's a platform for us to use. There's not going to be some pretty little event which a bunch of world leaders and Bill Gates can come to and give a bunch of money away. It's now time. We're 30 years into AIDS. Enough is enough. People, maybe people aren't dying in the numbers today, but people sure as hell are going without services. We, have, we don't have a waiting list in our state. Our state is so, CDC wants to concentrate on positive, positive prevention next year, wants to concentrate on testing. If a million people showed up in this country positive tomorrow, the system would go bankrupt. We can't handle the system. We can't handle that many people. If 3,000 people showed up in the state of Indiana positive tomorrow, the Ryan White program would go bankrupt. Our state can't take care of these people. It's estimated right now even 1,200 people showed up positive tomorrow in our state through testing programs. Our state can't take care of them people. And that's, you can look at state statistics, state after state, they can't handle the number of people. We can't take care of Ryan White funding now with people. It's the pair of last resort. Our state will pay for three days of treatment for people using the Ryan White system. You can't get HAPA housing if you're an active drug user. You can't get HAPA housing if you've been convicted of certain crimes. In our state, you could be arrested for selling sex on the street, and you can get a sex offender's, be registered on the sex offender's list. That's other states, too. So once you register on the sex offender's list, you can't get housing in public housing. You can't get housing in most supportive housing programs. They won't house you. So what happens is the laws are so punitive. Our state's getting the Super Bowl next month. So all this effort has been made on STD testing and outreach. Every homeless person in our city in February, for two weeks, we'll have housing provided to them free of charge by the city of Indianapolis and by the Super Bowl committee. They will bus these people to motels. They've already rented the motels. They've ordered every outreach worker that works for the county to go out and round up homeless people. They will get catered meals for two weeks. So 3,000 homeless people that they're going to round up all over our city will have a place to live for two weeks. Well, we said to the Super Bowl committee, instead of spending $5 million on this, build supportive housing for $5 million. 
Superwall Committee came back and said, we're building you 500 homes for homeless people. Well, what they're doing is building 500 homes, they're gonna place 500 homeless people in these homes with no support. These are people that have lived on the streets, they're gonna provide no social care, not how to take care of their finances, how to take care of their bills, how to take care of their children, nothing. They're gonna place all these people in new homes. And know what's gonna to happen to these homes in two years? They're all gonna be wrecked. And what's gonna happen? Developers are gonna scoop in and scoop all blocks of neighborhoods up. Cheap. We already told them that's what's gonna happen. So we know what's, and developers are saying, we're, we're, we're gonna build all these homes for these poor people. Fine. But in two years, I know it's gonna happen. You're gonna have all these homes back. And developers will then rent them to nice, white, middle class people. And, and forget about the rest of us. I live in an apartment complex near the racetrack at Speedway, Indiana. Um, my apartment complex is trying to sell their apartment complex now because they realize 70% of the people that live in that apartment complex are working class people. We go to work every day, we pay our rent, but they're also another 30% African American, 15% others from Africa. And they want us all out of that apartment complex because now they want to upgrade it, upgrade the pools and everything else. So they want a nice suburban type people to live in these apartment complexes. But what they're realizing is people don't want to live there. So they're stuck with us. I have a two year lease to protect and I'm not moving out. I like living there, it's quiet. I have a few problems with the neighbors, but I don't bother anybody. Like I asked the drug users, people that come to family that come to my house for syringes, respect my house. Knock on my door and ring my doorbell. Just don't come up and pound on the door. I had one two weeks ago pound on my door and I have some. I said, no, you're gonna to have to leave. And when you call me and, and act like a human being, come back and bar, knock on my apartment and ring my doorbell, then I'll serve your needs. He said, well, I'm gonna go use dirty stuff. That's not on me. But if you want people want to be treated with respect, that act with respect. And that's what I say to the community that I serve. I will close with that. I say to the people that I serve, when you go back to the communities, like for example, in Chicago, where syringe exchange takes place, there's no crime for three hours in, a, in a, where the van goes to. It's like all oh, the police run stopped, the crime stops. It's a high crime, one of the highest crime areas in Chicago that they go to. When the needle exchange van comes in, there's no crime. Where does all that crime go to? The community pleases themselves and said they don't want it. I've told the community that I serve, don't do certain things. Don't come to our apartment complex and hang out in my parking lot and drink and do drugs. I won't serve your needs, I can't. I can't place my family, my wife, and her step my stepdaughter, and anything in jeopardy. But if you wanna to come to my apartment and be treated as a human being, I'll treat you as my brother or my sister. If you need a place to stay, you're free to sleep on my floor out of respect, but respect me. Don't do no dope in my house. That's just, it's my house. I don't do, do stuff in your house, don't do it in my house. And if your house happens to be in the street and I'm on the street serving your needs, at least treat me with respect. If you don't, I don't have to really do the best I can. So I close with that by saying, if anybody wants to help us, we have our address. We, we're tax exempt, and if anybody knows where we can get our good computer system free, we put that out. So we put the message out, and like last year, we put the message out about the van, and people delivered a van to us. They didn't have to, but they drove it all the way, filled up with supplies. <laughs> so I thank you for allowing me to share.